Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, farmers, this is a bonus episode for you all. We really appreciate you all helping us um, take the Thriving Farmer podcast way beyond what we thought it would be. We're now getting a ton of downloads every single week, every single month. We just passed 40,000 downloads as of July 29th. So we're super happy about that. Again, thank you so much. And it means the world to us when you guys do go ahead and leave ratings on iTunes and Stitcher and all those other podcasty sites. Um, What I wanted to pop on with Becky was is winter onions. So Becky and I ran into each other at a conference recently put on by Sandy Arnold, the Frozen Ground 3 conference, where we discussed deep winter growing with the likes of Elliot Coleman and a bunch of rock star farmers all across the country. And I'm going to have Sandy on at a later point to discuss that conference and the takeaways from it. But talk to Becky. We were discussing winter onions and I was like, you know, this would actually be a really good time to do a podcast on that because the dates to start planting those is coming up. So we carved time out of our schedule, recorded this for you. A little bit about Becky is Becky is originally from California. She was a plant geneticist and lettuce breeder in Salinas. So in the heart of vegetable world production is where she kind of came from. She joined UNH, University of New Hampshire in 2004 and has a split appointment as a cooperative extension sustainable horticulture specialist and an extension professor of sustainable agriculture and food systems. So she teaches some classes. She does some research. She answers growers questions. She's in the thick of it. She's a fabulous uh, researcher. I'm always, again, calling on her when I have questions. And I know you're going to enjoy this episode. We go deep into winter onions. We go deep into fertility for high tunnel tomatoes. And we talk a little bit about what it's like to be a researcher, especially in the Northeast, and how she feels that actually research should be changing, that the way we're doing it is not quite as constructive as it could be. So have a listen and let us know what you think. Welcome to the podcast, Becky. Could you tell us a little bit more about you and your background? Sure thing. And thanks for having me. Um, I grew up on a diversified farm in Vermont and have been involved in agriculture ever since I was little. I studied plant genetics as a graduate student to be a plant breeder and became a researcher. And one thing led to another. And now I'm an extension faculty member at the University of New Hampshire. I teach, I do research, and I do outreach with farmers. Yeah, you're someone whose name is is tossed around a lot with, if you need a question answered or something like that, you usually come up. So (laughs) I think you're doing a good job. I said, well, I appreciate that. I do my best. (laughs) Okay. So talk to us a little bit about what drew you to extension work. Well, I, after I finished graduate school, I took a research job and I was a hundred percent research, which I loved. Mm -hmm. Part of that involved working with the lettuce industry, and I realized that it was really engaging with growers and grower presentations and solving growers' needs that was really the most fulfilling for me. And so that coupled with my background with New England agriculture and really wanting to do something to help New England farmers, small-scale farmers, well, all scales really, it was, seemed like a natural fit to combine research and extension here. Gotcha. So what does a a typical day look like for you with your job now? Well, it's hard to find a typical day, something that I suppose most farmers can also relate to. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Some days are filled with visiting farms and learning about what's going on out in the field, um, troubleshooting problems. Pretty much every day is filled with email and phone conversations and answering questions from growers and other Uh, extension folks. Some days I'm working at the research farm, collecting data, working on experiments, and some days I'm teaching uh, on campus with undergraduate students. Yeah, so talk to us a little bit about the teaching. Is that actual in classroom or is it more on the farm? It's some of both. I coordinate our sustainable agriculture and food systems major here Mm -hmm. at the University of New Hampshire, and I teach the introductory sustainable Uh, agriculture course. So it's actually, there's some in-classroom actual lectures and getting people, I try to get people out on the farm, but uh, in the middle of the winter, it's sometimes nice to be in the classroom. Absolutely. Yes. Let's talk about some of your more recent research. What have you been working on lately? Well, 
I'm just in the process of wrapping up a, a project focused on high tunnel nutrient management. Interesting. Um, yeah, for tomatoes in particular, trying to figure out what kind of potassium needs our high tunnel tomato crops have. And that has proven to be a really challenging project, but one that I really saw a need for. I'm also working on a project now looking at managing insect pests of brassica crops. And in particular, I'm focusing on cabbage aphid because I've seen mm-hmm. that really tough problem for growers, um, especially organic growers. But I have a bunch of projects that relate to various specialty crops, either brand new crops or kind of new ways of growing crops that farmers already grow. And those are really fun projects. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Let's dive in on that, that uh, tomato project you're working on. So you said that was really challenging. Did you come up with anything that you thought was a, a takeaway from the study that kind of stood out? Yeah, we definitely did. Um, so as I said, our project was focused on potassium mm-hmm. nutrition, uh, in particular looking at organic sources. And the one thing that we really took away was that tomatoes consume a lot of potassium. And mm-hmm. so we could really, they would suck up, a single crop of tomatoes would suck up even the highest rates of potassium we provided to them within a growing season, which was not what we expected. We, we really expected that we would be able to saturate it, but we could not. You know, these high yielding crops and tunnels just take a lot, a lot of nutrients. Okay, so then with that, are you were you like uh, side dressing every month, or did you provide a big charge up front? And when you said you couldn't max them out, how many pounds were you applying, and that that just couldn't be maxed out? Well, we were applying our highest rate was about nine hundred pounds to the acre of oh, wow. actual K, and so that did not max them out, um, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we were applying it all up front in a single charge. Okay. Initially for the experiment. And then in later years, we started playing around with the side dressing or actually dissolving and adding on as liquid um, yeah. to try to see whether we might be able to, to kind of meet those needs better. Um, so basically where we're at is we are adjusting the high tunnel tomato nutrient recommendations um, working all regionally across New England, but we're also sort of rethinking um, how we study these things and whether research station, I'm rethinking whether research station experiments are really the best way to try to figure out how best to manage uh, nutrients in high tunnel tomato. Interesting. All right. So when you're applying, let's say 900 pounds of potassium to the acre, what kind of yields are you getting per plant with that kind of rates? Well, you would think that it would correlate directly. And in some, I will say that the higher potassium rates in our study did result in higher marketable yields. The actual numbers are probably not super meaningful because we had pretty low marketable yield rates due to some challenges with irrigation and Mm. yellow shoulder and some other things. But also we were holding nitrogen constant, which is probably a more accurate determiner of yield or more important determinant of yield. So, yeah. Okay, interesting. Because you're holding the nitrogen constant, they weren't able to fully express themselves like they normally would have been. Well, exactly. We were not increasing, you know, some farmers are putting down much, much higher rates of nitrogen than that um, and getting accordingly much higher yields than we were. Yeah, you and I were both at the Frozen Ground Conference and actually this whole thing of nutrition and especially tunnel nutrition was a very contentious topic. And I think one of the most highly debated one there, but it was really interesting just to see the massive disparity between the farms and what they're using. Well, that's exactly it. And that's exactly why I am really rethinking how best we should study tunnel nutrient management, because one thing we realized a good chunk of the way through our project was that our three experiment station sites We weren't using compost because it's too variable and Mm -hmm. several other things. And when you actually look at what farmers are doing, it's the practices are so variable that I began to really question to what, how we really 
study those systems that reflects reality mm-hmm. on the farm. Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense because you're right. There's so many other variables that you guys can't be seeing all of them. Exactly. But here comes the rub is that farmers on farm frequently don't have the time to keep their enough of pertinent records to actually do a good quality study. Well, that's right. That's exactly right. And so last summer, a bunch of us across New England cooperated to basically go and collect data, soil samples, regularly tissue samples, interview farmers about their fertility practices on, I don't know, something like 30 farms across New England. And that was incredibly interesting. We also got some yield data, basic yield data. That was really interesting because it gave us sort of this snapshot of the diversity that's out there. And really the take home was that there are many, many successful approaches. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about one of the other major projects you've been working on, um, which is the overwintered onions. Tell us a little bit about what the opportunity there is. Well, I got into this project because I actually saw farmers doing it and having some trouble pulling it off. And what the opportunity they saw was, um, was that if you fall plant onions and are able to protect them over winter and you can get a fresh bulbed onion with green nice tops sometime in May, you really have a more complete offering at your farmer's markets, at your farm stands. And so they were seeing a real um, market demand for these early season onions, which surprised me honestly at first, but it has really shown to be true. (laughs) Farmers do seem really interested in this, having a real early season onion like that. Yeah, because you can definitely store onions, but at that time of year, you're normally getting like a, a yellow storage onion, which just does not have the same flavor profile as, let's say, a fresh out of the field onion. Well, that's right. And um, the overwintered fresh onions are milder. And if people don't have really ideal storage conditions, it's actually a challenge to have a really nice quality marketable storage mm-hmm. onion. Um, when we start getting into mid-late May. Certainly you can if you have all your parameters dialed in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the cycle of this here. So you're planting them um, in the fall and you can do sets and transplants, but let's first talk some dates. What kind of dates are farmers achieving of planting these? Well, I can speak to the dates we've used and the farmers right around me. I suspect that these dates are going to vary quite a bit depending on where you are. Uh We're in zone 5B and for us, our seed dates range from mid-August to mid-September with transplanting into the field a month later, so mid-September to mid-October. Okay. And then row covering or protecting in whatever way you're going to protect them. We'll probably talk about that later. Protecting them late fall and then harvesting in, depending on the spring and how early a spring it is, how warm a spring it is, sometime in mid to late May. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So that's the cycle there. I think one of the other advantages is that it's predominantly using a time of year when not much is growing in the field anyway. Well, that's right. Yeah. So it's hogging up space for a long time, but there's not a lot of other stuff in that space. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked a little bit about the advantages, but what are some of the other advantages for this type of system? Well, it is sort of a set it and can be sort of a set it and forget it system. If you get them installed, get their low tunnels set over them uh, in the fall, you really can pretty much leave them alone and then have a very nice early season crop. Um, I would say that would be the main advantage. There definitely are disadvantages as well. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about those. What can be some disadvantages that you do see? It is a long time in the ground. And so for that reason, I think they don't make a lot of sense in high tunnels, maybe in some cases if people don't have another use for it. 
but um, this can be a problem if you have a population of winter annual weeds that are difficult to control. Um, you need to come up with a plan for that. It will work best for you if you provide some level of protection over those onions. Mm -hmm. And with any kind of protection, such as low tunnels, come its set of hassles that we could discuss, but such as dis disassembling themselves on Christmas morning and all these kinds of things. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the most basic levels of protection people are doing is just, let's say, a couple layers of row cover. Yeah, I have mostly seen that with scallions, but it mm -hmm. is possible. I, I do think that in many cases, onions would do well under that system as well. Yes, mm -hmm. so that's how we preliminary do it out here in Ohio, and we're 6B. So, oh. yeah, we just, I mean, we actually, our process is, we have a bed of super late lettuce or greens coming out, and then we just stuff the onion sets next to where the stem was. Ah. And then the next, and we just throw the row cover right back over it. And the next spring, they just pop up, and we try to fertilize them as quick as possible. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, we're a little warmer than you guys, where you are, so it allows us to do it. But yeah, I know like Sandy Arnold does some in like a kind of a caterpillar style tunnel and then half out in the field with just row covers, I believe. But the low tunnels, as you said also, those are more like a two or three foot tall tunnel, correct? That's right. Um, most of my work with low tunnels has been about a two and a half, three foot tall low tunnel covered with heavy row cover and a layer of six mil poly. Okay, so you're getting the row cover and the poly for the, the double protection there. Exactly. Gotcha, okay. Um, and so, so is that like a half inch conduit metal that they're using for the hoop? It can be. I actually have, uh, some half inch EMT metal that's bent. And I also have some that are PVC. And I, interestingly, I started with the PVC because it was inexpensive mm -hmm. and then I upgraded to the EMT but I prefer to use the PVC and I've been using them for like a decade now because um, it, once they're bent, it's challenging to get the EMT back in, in our soils. If that uh, makes sense, you don't get yes. much purchase on them. Yeah. So, it's almost like you'd have to pre-drill a hole yeah. then for the EMT, whereas the plastic, you can just make it every single time easily. Exactly. Interesting. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about sets or seeds. Um, I know there's people throwing that around. What's the difference? Well, the difference from an operational standpoint is that sets are very easy. They come ready to plant, and all you have to do is slap them in the ground before the ground freezes. So um, they're definitely very easy. When you start with seeds, you have more variety options, Mm -hmm. But you have to start them. And in our area, that has to happen in mid-August, which is a challenging time for most vegetable growers to think about starting something. Mm -hmm. So in my research, I've mostly focused on seeds because I was really interested in the varietal ones available. And actually, the sets were not available um, when I started the work, but they do pose a bit of a, a, bit of a more hassle. <laughs> Hey, Michael here. I hope you are enjoying this episode so far. If you are looking to shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources. There we have a resource bundle, which contains a bunch of different eBooks that we put together over the years on everything from winter growing to washing shed efficiency, to pastured poultry processes, to building your farm and buying the right property. One of the resources I want to highlight is our Profitable Farmers Toolkit. Now, this is something that's been downloaded by over 3,000 farmers. It's a free resource. It contains tips for setting up your farm, financial systems and apps that you can use to track your farm, our favorite tools for the greenhouse, field and washing shed, innovative apps for farming and how to put automated systems in place to make your farm run more efficiently. So if you haven't already, pop on over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download it today. So let's talk a bit about varieties. Um, I know the varieties change constantly, but are there some that have stood out that you really like? Yeah, there are. So one of the things that's about this system of overwintering onions is that variety choice is essential because planting an onion in the fall and letting it survive the winter 
gives it exactly the conditions to make it think it has survived the winter and then should flower because it's a biennial. And so you need to choose varieties that are very, very, very tolerant to bolting. And so they have to have either been just fortunately happened to be tolerant to bolting or selected for that purpose. And so um, if you plant ones that weren't, you won't get bulbs, you'll get flower stalks. So the ones that we have found that are very, very resistant to bolting is there's a number of yellows, um, yellow storage onions. Um, Bridger uh, is a early intermediate day onion, um, but then a bunch of long days like gatekeeper and highkeeper and keepsake and tough ball and these kinds of things. Those are yellows. Walla Walla, a lot of growers have success with. Walla Walla in our studies was pretty intermediate bolting resistant. And mm. so what meant is that in some years, especially if it was planted early and therefore got more of that signal to bolt, it will bolt in high percentages. But in other years, you can really get lucky and they're gorgeous big bulbs. So it was a little on the edge. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. What about red onions? Are there any red onions that you've liked? There are. There are really three red onions, which I have found to do well in this system. One of them is Desert Sunrise, which is a short day red, and it has a very characteristic flat shape, Mm -hmm. uh, a flattened globe, which some people really like and some people don't like, but it's quite characteristic. And it, it, it also has intermediate resistance to bolting. The other two look a little more typically round, uh, Red Rock and Electric. Um, Electric is a very late to fall top onion. So I don't know, maybe I'm not saying that well, but the tops really stay rigid and are very thick necked. And so some people find that a little challenging because they may not actually dry down as a mature onion if you wanted them to. But if you harvest them early, that probably is not a problem. Yeah. So basically they just, they won't fall over until super late. Yep. Gotcha. Let's talk about fertility for these onions. Um, Are you front loading that all when you plant them or you usually then come in and side dress in the spring? What are people finding works? Well, that's a really good question. And I would love to know what other people are finding works. For all of our research, we front loaded because we did not have access to easy winter water. I didn't feel I could necessarily put anything through the drip. I did always put them on plastic because of weed control issues. And I just felt that side dressing was going to be logistically challenging for me. So Mm -hmm. I floated. I think that in some settings, if you were set up to do otherwise, they might benefit from spring applications, but they'd have to be real early Mm -hmm. because they really start sizing up in April. So you'd have to be able to really get get it to them quite early. Yeah, that's exactly what we found is that I think they would benefit in our soils, especially from a spring application, but it's got to be as like as soon as the ground thaws or as soon as they start to green up, you need to hit them with some, you know, probably chili in through the drip or even fish through the drip to make them really wake up well. Yeah, I think that's probably true. We never did that just because of logistical challenges with it. But you still had really good results, so it's not necessary. That's right. In our case, we found it was really, uh, it was not necessary. Had we done it, it might have been better, but yeah. <laughs> hypothetical. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know there are a number of other growers doing this. So yeah, if we can get their feedback on this episode, that would be great. So how much nitrogen were you putting down? Did you have standard rates that you were using in this environment? Yeah, we just followed the typical soil test recommendations for main season onions and applied, again, pre-plant using slow release amendment in the fall, figuring that they are going to eventually put on the same amount of growth as a main season onion. And so that was our strategy. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what those rates were, but they were standard soil test recommendations for onions. Yeah. And that would be in the New England Vegetable Growers Guide has those recommendations? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So let's talk about water. You said you weren't able to do winter watering, but once the spring hits, how often were you? Obviously in the fall, you water them a couple times to get the water in. Yes. Although 
in the fall, rainfall is a little more abundant. And Mm -hmm. I did not put drip under those. uh, I did not put drip under those beds because I was doing them in this bizarre extra wide bed scenario, which resulted in me not being able to put drip easily. And so I was merely overheading them in if I needed it. And so I was trying to rely on natural rainfall. So I would say irrigation was sporadic for me. Very interesting. Okay. And then in the spring? In the spring, uh, I think it depends on your soil type and how well it holds water. Certainly a lot of the farmers that I work with have got, you know, it might well be that they don't really need a lot of moisture until early May. <laughs> Dep- yeah. In one of the sites here at the research farm where I've done a lot of work, the soils do dry out very much. And we were watering at least once a week to make sure that they were getting about their inch a week, especially Mm -hmm. when they started putting on big growth in the spring. Yeah, absolutely. What are farmers, how are farmers selling these? I think we mentioned the green top. Is that how the majority are selling them? Are they any other unique ways that they're using the marketing those? That is a great question. And um, I guess I would love to hear feedback from the listeners of the podcast on this. I, the ones that I know that are selling them are selling them with green tops and are selling them, you know, fresh, high value through farmer's markets. But I have no doubt there's other novel ways to do it that I'm just not aware of. Yeah, I'll try to get some pictures from Sandy Arnold because I know she's she's one of the, you know, they do this every single year and um, this is a number, a huge crop for them. And I think they're getting a dollar to $2 each for the onions on their stand when they have nice big ones. So I'll try to include those in the show notes for people so they can check that out. That's cool. Yeah. So I think the other way that Paul and Sandy have kind of done this too is that they're actually decreasing the amount of regular planted onions they're doing because this is now such a large part and they're just allowing these to go through late summer. So they're basically cutting off the first two to three months of their regular planted onion sales and being able to shut the, do a smaller amount for those. Yeah. One thing that surprised me when I started doing this work actually is that I was trying to wait for the next to fall so that I could determine, so that I could fairly compare sizes, Mm -hmm. you know, alternate sizes just for a research standpoint. But I realized during the process that these dry down beautifully and they store beautifully. And so there is no reason once they are dried down that they could not be sold as any other onion through the fall. Yeah, I'll actually let you in on a little secret that out here in Ohio, we only plant the overwintered ones. No, oh, really? Huh. Yeah, and we only don't have onions for usually about a month in April. Wow. That Yeah, we're storing them through the end of March. And that's, again, just in our basement, which stays around 60 to 65 degrees all winter, the pretty low humidity. So yeah, it's, I mean, I think obviously on scale, that's probably not going to be working the same characteristics, but um, it's, it's, it's just fascinating how well they store. So yeah. no, I found the same thing. And I think it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, talk about diseases and insects. What are we seeing there? Is it less because of the, the time that you're planting them or? Well, actually, um, I haven't, in the first couple of years I was doing overwintering onions, I didn't see many diseases. And in fact, I would have told you at that time that I thought there were fewer diseases and insects than Mm -hmm. in summer grown onions. I would amend that now. And the very worst example of onion thrips I've ever seen was the year we tried to include onions in a high tunnel, overwintered onions. And they were really, really, it's a great environment for onion thrips. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've also had just this last year, I believe, the first reports of downy mildew on onions, overwintered onions in the Northeast, a common disease in the Pacific Northwest, but we don't see it a lot because we don't tend to have those cool, humid, well, the same kinds of conditions, but I think overwintered onions are just perfect for that if the conditions are right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's certainly something to pay attention as, to as well. Especially if they're in a tunnel, which has really humid, wet in the early spring, probably. 
Exactly. Yes. Especially in, or a field that's particularly wet outside. The other thing that occurred to me a couple years ago, the last time I actually did overwintered onions here, was that the onion maggot, which we typically think about as an early spring pest, um, where the flies will lay their eggs at the base of the onion plant, and then the maggots will eat off the roots of the onions just for our transplants. They actually took out one of my fall planting dates because they continually cycle through the growing season, and I just happened to bad timing hit a flight. <laughs> oh boy. So um, it wasn't a big deal for me because I had. A whole bunch of different planting dates and was, you know, looking at that. And it was really good to see that that's possible. But so I think that while we thought we might escape some of those pests, yeah, we might not in all cases. Yeah, there still might be some challenges. So you definitely want to hedge your bets with still the summer planting. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Paul and Sandy this year had some significant dieback in the field. And they were trying to rack their brains with exactly what that could have been. Um, and we kind of came to the understanding it could have been some really soggy late weather as well as some sudden freezes. So they're not bulletproof, although they are just incredibly hardy. <laughs> so, Yep, I think that's a fair assessment. Yep. Anything else about this crop we should know? Well, I'm just sure interested to hear what other people's experiences are with it. I guess the only other thing I would add to this is that um, I have recently, based again on hearing that farmers were doing this, started to branch out a little and into scallions, which mm. can be a very high value crop as well. And they are similarly hardy and have similar varietal responses to bolting. And so there is, um, if one branches into overwintering onions, one might consider overwintering scallions as well. I think they also pose a, a similar kind of advantage for that early season market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and especially those, I feel, respond really well to um, additional protection, let's say a hoop house or even a high tunnel. They could, although in my research, I've been using just row covers on them, uh, not even including them in the low tunnel. So oh, very interesting. They look sad when you take it off, but they perk up quickly. Yeah, and then just come right back. Let's just kind of go back a little bit into your more general job, because I know we've dived into onions and we kind of probably um, discussed that more than a lot of people would like to know, but bugs and diseases, that's something that I know a lot of farmers um, struggle with, and usually their, their modus operandi is just to post a picture in the group and then everyone dissects it, and half the time or three quarters of the time it's wrong, and that's never good. What process would you like farmers use to identify those and then treat those? Well, you know, pictures can be misleading. And whenever I see that there's pictures posted to a group, there usually is the right diagnosis, but it's mixed in with, you know, several wrong ones. And it's hard to pull out what is for sure the right one. And I guess I would just say, reach out to your local extension folks not only will they do their due diligence to get you the right answer or to say, from that picture, we can't tell anything. <laughs> yeah. um, it also helps them know what's going on. And it can help them kind of be alerted to problems that they might not see if they don't happen to be out in the field. And so i you know, so much can be done with photos now. You don't necessarily, you might in some cases have to send in a sample, but, you know, most of your plant diagnostic labs can, will happily accept a digital image and say, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. And it helps educate them and other growers too. So yeah. I, I really strongly encourage that. And usually just submitting a photo is free. They usually is not a charge for that. Yeah, usually that's the case. And there is usually, although not in every state, there is often a charge for um, submitting a physical sample because the diagnostic lab is going to culture something out and spend a lot of time identifying it. But usually for a quick look at a photo, um, that can be really helpful in determining, oh yeah, this is really common. This is what it is. Or you better get a sample in because it could be something. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that can, yeah. So it's either to the diagnostic lab or to your local extension specialists. Yeah, and one thing I would recommend that the new phones are just, picture quality is incredible, but if you also pick up like a macro lens for that, it can make identifying them so much better because you can get such a, a closer picture. That's true. The, the pictures have gotten enormously better in the last five years. Yeah. And another thing I would say too is instead of just trying to kill the insect, sometimes it's better to freeze it so you don't actually destroy the insect as you're trying to kill it so you can get a picture. Oh yeah, that's a really good point. Then they hold still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very good. Chill them down. They often photograph better after a little time in the fridge, I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Oh, I love this question and it's hard because I have many favorite farming tools, but I think my favorite farming tool has got to be the high tunnel. Mm -hmm. The high tunnel is just an incredible thing that we're able to create this microclimate that enables us to jump a few growing zones away from where we actually live. Um, and for our area, it enables real winter year round production. It, it changes the whole landscape. Yeah. You know, Vern Grubinger said that uh, when he was on the podcast, he said the exact same thing. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we think alike. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I absolutely, yeah, it's one of my tops too. So it's, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's such a key tool. Where can people find more about you and your work? Well, we have lots of applied research reports and stuff on the UNH Cooperative Extension website. But um, if people just want to kind of know a little bit about what we're up to, I would suggest going to Instagram and going to UNH Sideman Lab. Oh. It's a fun way for us to sort of share what we're up to on a regular basis. And I actually love, you know, so many farms are on there as well. I love just seeing what everybody else is up to. It's been a really um, nice way to sort of exchange information in a kind of beautiful way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very cool. I'm actually there right now. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely add that to the show notes as well as the regular UNH site so people can find out. And there's I'm going to be ports are posted there as well, I'm assuming. Yeah, they're posted on the, um, on the UNH extension site. Um, if anybody has any trouble finding them, they can always pop me an email or give me a call and I'll send them their way. Awesome. Becky, thanks so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. And I know growers are going to get a lot out of this interview. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's Thriving 